Good morning, good morning, good morning. I love this church. <laughs> One of the reasons why I love this church is we get started when we get started. What are we in the midst of in our church? Be the one. Be, be the one. <laughs> uh, be the one, and that's a, um, it's a really an offshoot of the uh, story of Jesus where ten members are healed. And you have to presume that all ten would be grateful, but only one, only one came back to express gratitude. And so one of our uh, our big emphasis this fall is to be the one, to be the one that acknowledges <clears throat> the ways in which I have benefited uh, from God's goodness uh, working through other people, God's goodness uh, simply through nature, uh, through other gifts that I have received. So folks are invited <clears throat> each day to write down five things for which they are grateful from the previous day. We have a booklet here. If you don't have one, there are ones in the back of the church. How many folks have been doing this? If you haven't been doing this, if you forget a day or two, uh, just keep on at it. Keep at it. Just keep at it. That's okay. Forget a day or two. Just keep at it. And each week we're going to have a little bit of a report from someone in the church as to how this is going. Last week we heard from Chris. Next week we hear from... Who we hear from next week? Uh, who is it? Uh, Nancy. We hear from Nancy. And today we hear from the one and only Sue. Sue, if you could come forward and tell us how this is going for you, that would be great. You have to speak right into the microphone. You have to hold it really close. Uh, you know, as I was it has to be closer. Uh, right out of the microphone. Really close. So, as I was thinking about this, um, closer. Yeah, it has to be right out of the microphone. Right out of the microphone. There you go. Yes, thank you. <laughs> as I was thinking about this, I don't like to get up and talk to folks, but you are a family, so you. You'll be, okay. <laughs> You'll be okay with this. Most families are dysfunctional, so forget about it. I live in one, so we're good. But the other thing is, I thought, someday I'm going to have to meet my neighbor, so I think this is a preview. I think this is a dress rehearsal. It's a dress rehearsal. There you are. <laughs> so I was hoping Peter and Andy would be here today because... Um, one of the first that I put down was spending time with Peter and Annie and Dick under the umbrella table during our coffee hour. We love you. Pardon me? We love you. I know, I see that. And I'm grateful. I know Sharon keeps telling me to put it up. It's got to be one of the so people can hear. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I am thankful for my husband. He fills our hummingbird feeders. <laughs> And I can't preach them. Um, I'm very thankful that I can see my grandchildren, Michaela and Hayden, and our other grandchild, Haley, is out in California, and we get to see her YouTube playing softball. So that's that's pretty amazing when you can do that. She knows we're watching. So, um, okay. So I really wanted to get to one that was recent here. Um, this past Thursday, I had a conversation with, which I was thankful for, with Abby, who was the activity director over to Holton Home. She needed help with serving a special noontime meal to 10 of the folks that signed up for that. It was to be a Chinese meal. I'm reading this because my husband tells me I'm a good writer. <laughs> so, so knowing that, God would be walking beside me to work with her and Joan was part of this crew. I would be going over to Holton Home early for the setting of tables and for um, colorful tablecloths and fresh flowers from their gardens. Abby Joan, who picked up the food from Pan-Asia, and myself, would come together to serve this special meal to our guests. Connie, who is 106, and she is the oldest there, 
loving Jesus. She sat down to the meal and she said, I want to try everything from soup to nuts. Now we did have everything from soup to nuts and fortune cookies. After thinking on this phrase myself, I too want to take in all the blessings that God provides me with for all my days. Thank you, Sue. Now, we're going to pray. You may give the glory to God and give uh, thanks to the Lord and Sue, our spirit, our friends. For the Thanksgiving booklet, uh, I encourage you to, to contemplate some of the things that Sue mentioned. Uh, I really appreciate her gratefulness for her husband for filling up the Hummingbird theaters. There are lots of little things that happen during our day. Part of the reason for this exercise is to help us to become aware of what I would call those little blessings. Little blessings. And as we become more aware of those little blessings, it really changes the way in which we look at our day. And we see the goodness that abounds. Uh, our inclination oftentimes is not necessarily to notice those things. We shall continue our worship or begin our worship with our um, prayer of thanksgiving, our prayer of confession. And uh, there will be a time of silence before we begin the prayer, as well as a time of silence within the prayer. Let us pray. O oh Lord, I confess that I am captive to sin and cannot free myself. I have become preoccupied with myself and my desires. I have become attached to all that I wish to accomplish on my terms and in my style. Save me from my ego, that I may live centered on Christ, and may come to accept and love those around me. Let us pray. Forgive me, me renew me, and lead me, that I may live according to your call, and bring glory to your holy name. The word of God through Jesus is that no matter how many times we fall, God is there to fix it. No matter how deep the valley that we find ourselves in, God's grace is there to feed us and to lift us up. The word of Jesus is a word that we are forgiven, that we are loved, that we are accepted. It's one of my privileges to proclaim the entire community of all of our sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand for a moment.
Grace and peace be unto you from God, our Creator, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus. May the church say, Amen. Amen. How many of you have been to Northfield, Massachusetts? Now, if you go to Northfield, Massachusetts, um, uh, right next to Mims, you know where Mims is? What do we have right next to Mims in Northfield, Massachusetts? The Creed is there. Now, I've been going to Northfield for six years. And I remember when I was a little kid in the summertime, we would call it was called the Yorkberry. And we would get out of the Yorkberry. There's four parking places there. I'd ride my bike down. You go to the Yorkberry and they had two flavors of ice cream. And what were those flavors? Chocolate and vanilla. Now you can go to the Yorkberry and oh, 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 when I was a kid, it was a huge treat. Because in the summertime for one week, they gave chocolate and vanilla, and they had black raspberry. Whoa. Whoa, that was a treat. That was a luxury. Three flavors. Now you can go to the Korean or the Yorkberry, and they have chocolate and vanilla, and 20 other flavors of soft ice cream. Not just soft ice cream. They have hard ice cream, separate, just the hard ice cream. And they have 15 different flavors of Ben and Jerry's. And they have another kind of hard ice cream that comes out of Northampton. I don't know what the name of it is. Bart's. Bart's. Yeah. They have Bart's ice cream. 15 flavors of Bart's hard ice cream. And then you can get ice cream sundaes. And you can get banana splits. What kind of ice cream do you want? Hard ice cream, soft ice cream, combination of the two. You can get um, uh, milkshakes. You can sit at the menu. It takes five minutes. To look at all the stuff they have there and figure out what you want. And it reminds me of the Burger King ad. You remember the Burger King? There's not a Burger King around here. The Burger King logo from a few years ago. What was the Burger King logo? Have it your way. Have it your way. <laughs> have it your way in your area. What do you want? We're going to give it to you on your terms. We're going to make you happy. It reminds me, a long time ago, some of you uh, might remember this. When you wanted to return something that you had bought at a store, you almost had to have your lawyer with you <laughs> to establish that you bought it. And then you were made to feel like the lowest human being. You know, this is too small for me. Well, why don't you lose weight back? <laughs> it was terrible to try to return something back in the 1960s and the 1950s. It was absolutely terrible. Now, I know people that have bought a pair of shoes. Six months later, when the shoes are worn, worn out, they return it. No question does. Have it your way. You come first. Customer supreme. It's all about me. That's the culture that we live in. We're surrounded by it. It's all about you, what you want, on your terms. And it is a dramatic shift from the way it used to be. I used to teach. And I remember when I was a kid, if you didn't do very well in class, what did your parents tell you to do? Study more. You had to study hard. You had to knuckle down. You had to go to the teacher and find out what you could do to improve your grade. I remember getting a phone call from a mother, high school teacher, high school kid, who asked me, how come my son is not getting a better grade in your class. <laughs> well, I told her, I said, well, I don't think your son is maximizing his potential to work hard in my class. It was a God gave me the words to say. He was just lazy. He didn't do any work. I couldn't say that a <laughs> lot, right? You're not maximizing your potential. The point is, the student, when we were kids, you did when your teacher expected, and if I either came home and said, my teacher's not giving me a good grade, my parents would have told me, well, you've been a work hard. Now, parents have called the teacher. Their parents who do this in college. 
Parents didn't see parents would even show up at the first job I ever gave for their kid. Because you are it. It's all about you. Now, if you're here in worship today, what I'd like to emphasize is that if you follow Jesus and you take it seriously, you're a rebel. You're a rebel. Because the word of Jesus is entirely countercultural. The message from our culture is what you want, we'll give it to you, you go get it, and you're going to be happy. And at some level, I think all of us realize that when I pursue my own happiness, it's just one thing after another. And I seem to be a bottomless pit of desires. So what does Jesus teach? You might want to look at the readings again. Jesus teaches here, whoever would save his life, or whoever seeks his life, whoever seeks happiness will lose it, will end up in hell. And I think the car will make me happy. It does for a day or two, and then it's back to normal again. I think the house will make me happy. It does for a little while, and then it's back to normal again. I think the new clothing, whatever it is I'm going to purchase, is going to make me happy. It does for a little while, and then I'm back to normal again. I think going out to dinner is going to make me happy. It does for a little bit, and then I'm back to normal again. Whoever would save his life, whoever would seek his life, will lose it. Jesus teaches it's going to be empty. And then he goes on and says, whoever loses his life or whoever gives of himself or herself will find life, will save it. That in giving of ourselves, we find meaning and fulfillment. It's a paradox. It doesn't seem true. It doesn't seem as though that could make sense. Because the culture we live in says it's all about you. What do you want? Go after your own happiness. And what Jesus is teaching is that way is going to lead you to a kind of despair and emptiness. You're going to seek life and you're going to lose it and you're going to end up with nothing. And then what he teaches is look, it's a countercultural message. Give of yourself. And in giving of yourself, you will find life. You will find blessing. You will find meaning. You will find fulfillment. And the way to get at this very simply, to ask yourself, if I knew next week I was going to die, what are the things in my life that I will value? That I stood up this morning. That you said, <laughs> well, when you stood up this morning, you gave of yourself to us. So yeah, you're right. You gave of yourself to us. You gave us a chunk of yourself. And I think we all realize it's not easy for you. So we, we, are, we feel that. What is it to think? What are the things that we will value? We will not value. Oh, I'm so glad I want that new car. Oh, I'm so glad we moved to that other house. We won't value that stuff. What we will value are the ways in which we gave to other people. Whether it's Holton Home, whether it's the refugee families, whether it's the family members, whether it's our kids or our parents. Those are the things that we will value. It's kind of a reality show. What we will value is where we found meaning and abundance in life. And we find meaning and value and abundance through what we gave of ourselves to the people around us. The food that we collect. The sacrifices we make for our neighbors. Someone told me they took apples and gave them to their friends. We will value those gifts. That's where life is found. So I want to put this in the context of our Thanksgiving book of this morning. When we think about Thanksgiving, we think about what we've received, how we have benefited from others, and how God has worked through others to bring blessing to our lives. And we're acknowledging those gifts when we write them down. There's a psychological power to that, so I know people will do that, even if you've lost a day or two here and there. Keep at it. Can we expand our concept of thanksgiving to be thankful for what we could give to others? Because that's where life is found. So can you 
think about it. I, I encourage you to do this. Go back over the last couple of weeks and, and find out how many times was I thankful for what I could give to the people around me. I was thankful for the phone call I could make to my friend. I was thankful for the help I could give to someone else. I was thankful for the blessing that I could be to the people around me. So it's just not all about me receiving direct gifts. But it's also, I can be grateful for what I can give to people around me. Because it is in that giving, that is where I have found life. And the issue for us is to remember, that's really rebellious in our culture. Our culture says, it's all about you. What kind of ice cream do you want? What do you need any flavor you want? It's all about you. So to say no to that, and to say, no, I find life by giving to other people, that's a rebellious thing to do. And when you do that, it's not uncommon for us to feel very unknown and isolated, because it's so unusual. So in those moments, we hold on to the blessing that God has given us. We find ourselves resentful, then we have to back off a little bit, get our cup filled up so we have something to give. But the point is, be a rebel. And acknowledge, I am giving to other people. And if we can't think of anything that we're giving to others, well, we know what the deal is. We've got to do a little work here. Because it's in that giving that we're going to find life. We were able to take a note of it and develop that awareness when you do the booklet as to how am I giving to others today? And can I, can I rejoice that I've been able to do that? Thank you for your attention. In Jesus' name.
that they pursue the welfare of the country and put behind them their own personal ambitions. May they see that it is in such giving that they find life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, we pray for those who, out of pride and separateness, refuse to follow a way of safety in this time of pandemic. We pray that they consider the welfare of all those around them and follow a path which cherishes health and well-being. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We are mindful, O oh Lord, of the refugees from Afghanistan and Haiti. Make us ever grateful for the goodness we receive in our country and move us to extend our blessings to give to others in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Bless, O Lord, our congregation. May all who come to worship find this community to be one of grace and encouragement. May your blessings rest upon our gathered, our gathering at Holton Home this afternoon and upon the gathering this Wednesday morning. Lord, in, in your mercy, do our prayer. Lord God, we lift up to you those who are dear to us who go through difficult times. We remember Bill Stone, who was hospitalized. Victor Garvey, who was in hospice care. We pray for Pastor Randy. For Sue's brother, Glenn. For the members of the Anderson family, Colin and Parker, Larry, Audrey, and Don. We pray for Christy Gilbert in this time of profound mourning. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be the strength of Peter and Annie Bowling. In the silence, Lord, we lift up to you the concerns that rest heavily upon our hearts.
This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and shed for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of the Lord. We proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ is still coming again. Together, O oh Lord, we pray the words that Jesus taught us.
The Lord is above us, for Jesus has prepared a place for us in God's heaven. And the Lord is with us. May we live with that awareness that we may be people of gratitude who are free to give ourselves. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The voices of singing are completely hymn that I have for us. <laughs>